Good morning. Welcome to our service of Sunday morning worship here at Fairview Moravian Church. Our pastor, Reverend Jeff Coppage, remains on leave this Sunday. Over the past week, Pastor Jeff has had some minor surgery up at the Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. He came through just fine. Uh, we'll have a couple of follow-up exams scheduled this week. In Jeff's absence, my name is Marshall Mathers. It is my pleasure to welcome you to worship this Sunday. If you're visiting with us, then it's a special privilege to welcome you this morning. One day we'll all be back in this room together and, and we'll see each other face to face. Look forward to meeting you on that day. That's gonna be a very good day. Uh, also, in Pastor Jeff's absence, our message this morning is brought to us by one of our members, Bill Shields. If you remember here, you know Bill well, but if you're not a member, uh, you may also know Bill. He uh, has preached at a number of churches in the Winston-Salem area and across the southern province. Bill, we look forward to your message this morning. Thank you. For our members here at Fairview, the search for a senior pastor uh, is moving forward. The joint boards attended another called meeting uh, again this week via Zoom over the internet. And we have also been in touch again with the Provincial Elders Conference. We're very grateful to our member, Jerry Haley, uh, whose computer expertise makes all of this possible, enables us to stay in touch while we're in isolation. Please continue to be in prayer, not only for our congregation and our worship, but for our staff, our boards, and the officers of the church. And if you will say a prayer as well for the Provincial Elders Conference. We are counting on them right now. Now let us worship God. Our call to worship this morning is a responsive reading, which you will see on your screen. I invite you to join me in reading this responsively. How glorious it is to hear of Jesus' resurrection. At his death, our hearts cried out and we felt lost. But he comes to us and walks with us even now. In the Holy Word, in the music, in the prayers, he is present with us. Open your hearts to the Lord. Lord, help us really be ready to receive you into our lives. Amen. We move now into a time of intercessory prayer. There are several prayer concerns that I would like to draw to your attention this morning. We've had several deaths of people in the church, our relatives of people in the church, and we want to keep these families in our prayers. The first of those is Noel Harris, who passed away on Monday of this past week. There will be a service celebrating Noel's life whenever the restrictions from the COVID-19 pandemic are lifted. We also want to continue to pray for Charlene Medley and her family in the death of her mother, Margaret Wilds, who passed away on April 15th. Also, we want to continue to keep the family of John Snyder in our prayers. He passed away on April the 10th, and there again, there will be a traditional Moravian burial service at a later date. Also, please keep Sherry Fulp's brother, Marty, in your prayers. Marty had surgery on Thursday to remove one of his kidneys. And as Marshall has already said, please keep our church board members in your prayers as they continue in the call process for calling our next permanent pastor. Would you join me in prayer? Jesus Christ, you travel through towns and villages, curing every disease and illness. At your command, the sick were made well. Come to our aid now in the midst of the global spread of the coronavirus that we may experience your healing love. Heal those who are sick with the virus. May they regain their strength and health through quality medical care. Heal us from our fear, which prevents nations from working together and neighbors from helping one another. 
Heal us from our pride, which can make us feel invincible to a disease that knows no borders. Jesus Christ, healer of all, stay by our side in this time of uncertainty and sorrow. Be with the families of those who are sick or who have died. As they worry and grieve, defend them from illness and despair. May they know your peace. Be with the doctors, nurses, researchers, and all medical professionals who seek to heal and help those effective and who put themselves at risk in the process. May they know your protection and your peace. Be with the leaders of all nations. Give them the foresight to act with charity and true concern for the well-being of the people they are meant to serve. Give them the wisdom to invest in long-term solutions that, that will help prepare for or prevent future outbreaks. May they know your peace as they work together to achieve it on earth. Jesus Christ, stay with us as we endure and mourn, persist and prepare. In place of our anxiety, give us your peace. Jesus Christ, heal us. Amen. Please join me in the reading of the uh, Liturgy of the Evangelism. Please stand. Holy, 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 the Lord Almighty is holy. God's glory fills the world. God of creation, whose love invites all people to receive the blessing reserved for us since before time began. Grant years of faith that each one may clearly hear your gracious call. God of salvation, whose love encompasses all humanity, who's assumed flesh and blood and died that all might live. Give eyes of faith, Lord Jesus that everyone may plainly see you among us. God of inspiration, whose love initiates new ways of reaching out to all who risk believing. Guide our lives in faith, that we may willingly become your instruments of love and truth. Please be seated. With gratitude to the Lord, we remember our rich heritage of committed servants who carried the good news to their neighbors throughout the world, who followed Jesus' command, go to all people and make them my disciples. 
We thank you, eternal God, for those who have gone before us, faithful to the Great Commission. We praise you for imparting to us the same mission to reach others for Christ. With humility before the Lord, we confess our sin when we fail to communicate Jesus' promise of new life, when we have not reached beyond ourselves with the words entrusted to us, when we retreat into comfortable sanctuaries and do not seek to be a light to the nations, when we become preoccupied with church involvement for its own sake and do not labor to proclaim salvation to the ends of the earth. Forgive Forgive us, us, we pray. pray when we fail to recognize that the measure of success is not only in the number of constituents, but also in the sincerity of conversion, when we are too timid or afraid to speak the gospel message to those who want to hear it, when we allow a life of ease to divert us from those who need your love through us. Forgive us, we pray. Touch our lips with the burning coals of your forgiveness. And purify our hearts. The Lord, your Redeemer, says, Now your guilt is gone, and your sins are forgiven. Please stand and join me. Throughout the ages, God calls missions, summons a response. We affirm our heartfelt yearning to reply. God asks, Whom shall I send? Who will be my messenger? And like Isaiah, the answer flows from our soul and forms on our lips. I will go, send me. God, our Redeemer, We share a longing to minister as partners together with you and each other. Our desires shaped by your will, our commitment molded by your covenant. We We dedicate ourselves to him this day. We We accept the challenge joyfully to to proclaim Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. We covenant with you to be loving instruments of understanding and forgiveness among those to whom you send us. We promise in you to be living invitations for others to meet you as Lord and Savior. We press on with resolve so that your word may spread rapidly and you may be glorified everywhere. We must work the works of him who sends us while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. We will go. Send us.
Be seated. Once again, this is the point in our worship when we receive tithes and offerings. I ask you to remember your church, whether your church is Fairview or if you worship at another church regularly, please remember that our financial needs do continue even if we're prohibited from using our buildings. Apart from week to week obligations, the church now more than ever wants to be in a position to come to the aid of those who are hurting can't watch the news these days without being moved for those whose businesses have closed or have lost their jobs. I was struck this week by a newsreel I saw of a food pantry. The cars lined around the building and around the parking lot, people waiting for assistance. Your church wants to be in a position to do something about that, and it needs all of us to do that. So let's pray. Our Father, you have left no doubt that when people are hurting, hungry, unable to provide for loved ones, you want us there, helping, supporting, easing the hurt. Move us, Father, to support your church so that we will be there as you want us to be. For it's in Christ's name that we pray, amen. Then a man called to us, 
standing on the shore, and we knew that he had risen. We have seen the risen Lord, we have heard his gentle voice saying, Be not afraid. We have felt his conquering power, known the have seen the risen Lord. We have seen the risen Lord. We have heard his gentle voice saying, Be not afraid. We have felt his conquering power, known the glory of this hour. We have seen the risen first scripture reading today comes from Acts chapter 2 verses 14 and 36 through 41. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Therefore let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you have crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourself from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. Our second reading comes from 1 Peter chapter 1, this is verses 17 through 23. If you invoke as father the one who judges all people impartially and according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile, you know that you were ransomed for the feudal ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart, you have been born in you, not of perishable but of imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of the God. Now join us in hymn 792, I Serve a Risen Savior.
Good morning. It's an honor to be here today, given the message at Fairview Moravian Church. Um, I want to just open with a brief prayer, please. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you in humility today. Even though we are not all together in worship here at church, we are together through your spirit. We are grateful for the privilege of putting this service out through the means of modern technology, especially through Jerry Haley. We are thankful for your presence, for your word, and for your grace given to us by our Savior. Loving God, please give us wisdom to discern your will, obedience to follow you, patience to wait in hope for you, clear vision to behold your sovereignty, an open heart to meditate upon you, and a humble walk to proclaim Christ. Through your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' precious name, amen. Our scripture today, and if you've got a Bible, you may want to open it up. It's long. Our lectionary has us in Luke chapter 24, 13 to 35. So it's a fairly lengthy uh, set of scriptures here. And I'm using the New Living Translation, um, and I'm going to read these briefly before we get into the message. The Walk to Emmaus. That same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. He asked, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened here the last few days. Jesus asked, what things? The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles. He was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priest and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group of his followers were at the tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing, and they had seen angels who told them, Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people! You find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures? Wasn't it clearly predicted that Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. By this time, they were near Emmaus and the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if he were going on, but they begged him, stay the night with us since it's getting late. So he went home with them. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread, blessed it, he broke it, and gave it to them. Suddenly their eyes were open, and they recognized him. At that very moment, he disappeared. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 disciples and others who had gathered with them, who said, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. Then the two from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road, and they recognized him as they were breaking the bread. And in verse 36, just so you know what happens next, and just as they were telling about it, Jesus himself was suddenly standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. 
Here ends the reading of our word. Have you ever wondered what it would be like for you and a close friend to be walking out in the open somewhere, maybe in nature, it may be just out on a road that's fairly secluded, and all of a sudden Jesus is in your midst? Can you just visualize the scene? Don't you think it would be an incredible spiritual event and conversation? But would you or I even notice it was Jesus who came among us? Our scripture today, taken from Luke's gospel, and in verse 12, just prior to this happening, we see Peter running to the empty tomb, looking in and finding the linen wrappings, wonder what had happened. And then immediately, we start with verse 13, two of Jesus' followers are on a trip to Emmaus. Scripture says it's about seven miles from Jerusalem. So they've got a pretty good hike to go. I imagine it was an adventure filled with an uncertain future. They were still mourning the loss of their Lord. They had felt Jesus was the Messiah. The two disciples deep in conversation, they were discussing what had happened. Undoubtedly, their faith had been shaken. I know mine would have been. Without warning, Jesus suddenly came up and began walking with them. Now, verse 16, the Bible says, Through his divine power, God kept them from recognizing their Lord. Now, I'm thinking, should they have not known Jesus? As followers of him, they had been with Jesus for three years. They had heard his teachings. They had seen his healings and experienced his miracles. Why would they not have realized it was Jesus? I think the mysteries of God's plan are worth exploring. Uh, Charles Spurgeon helped me understand a little bit more of this. Spurgeon wrote, Jesus is always with us. Why do we not see him? The disciples, as in our case, they experienced unbelief. They evidently did not expect to see Jesus. Therefore, they did not know him. In spiritual matters, to a great extent, we get what we expect of the Lord. Faith alone can bring us to see him. We have his word to read and reflect on, but make it your prayer. And I think this is a good prayer to remember. Lord, open thou mine eyes that I may see my Savior present with me. In our spiritual lives, if we don't sense our Lord, does that mean we're blind to him? During this health crisis, we can't lose sight of Jesus. He's the core of our Christian faith. In discussing the scripture with my wife, Gwen, I asked for her input. From a godly woman, and I'm blessed, she provided a little bit of perspective. And this is from Gwen. Today, as we cope with the emotional distress of how our lives have changed over the past weeks, we need to pray that our eyes are opened. We must stay prayerful for the opportunity that God gives us daily so we may help and love each other. Jesus is always by our side. All we have to do is look around. He is there, whispering words of hope. That was really good. Thank you, Gwen. Now, in verse 17, the conversation gets good. Jesus point blank asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? These two devout followers stopped and stood there with sad faces, Scripture says. Maybe they didn't know how to respond to his question. But the one named Cleopas, verse 18, says to Jesus, You must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard all these things that happened in the last few days. And then our Lord drops the bombshell question. He goes, what things? Personally, had I been there, I may have been speechless, even though my family would say, Dad, if you were going to Emmaus, you would have gotten lost, and I probably would have been. But seriously, Jesus could have revealed himself right there, 
or elaborated on the truth, maybe encouraged their hearts. Instead, he chose to wait on God's timing. Jesus gives them a chance to answer. And what an explanation this was. So they said the things that happened to Jesus of Nazareth, and they talked a little bit about what he was to them. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles, a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and the people. Then they say, our chief priests and religious leaders betrayed him, handed him over to be sentenced to death, and crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah, the one who would rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then women from our group and of his followers came back with an amazing report. Early that morning at the tomb, they couldn't find his body. They had seen angels who said Jesus was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb themselves and they found it empty. His body was gone exactly as the women had said. Now at this time, the two disciples who were with Jesus, they were still unaware who he was. I wonder if they asked his name. Surely they were discouraged and troubled. I'm thinking maybe they had doubt in their voices. After all, they believe Jesus is dead. His body's gone. In reflecting on their, their reasoning, I had a thought. Now, think back before the crucifixion, before Palm Sunday and Jesus' triumph entry into Jerusalem. Before any of these things had happened, Jesus had expressed an important revelation to his followers. Written in Matthew 18.20, and you'll be very familiar with this, Jesus had said, where two or three are gathered together in my name as my followers, I am there with them. The Lord had been there with them. His holy presence was always at the center of their activities, but they didn't recognize him. I wonder if you and I would have been the same way. And I ask myself, aren't there times when Jesus is in our midst and we don't realize he's there? We may miss God-given, spirit-empowered times with our Lord, and if we're not sensitive to his leadings and stay in devoted communion to him, we may miss his quiet, still voice. Maybe we're blind to his vision or deaf to what he's saying, but I think the key is prayer and the reading of his, of his scriptures. Now, after Jesus heard these remarks from his followers, and I think he probably said this with a bit of sarcasm, he goes, you foolish people. The King James actually translates this the followers were fools and slow of heart. You find it so hard to believe what the prophets wrote in the scriptures? Was it not prophesied and necessary for the Messiah to suffer all these things before entering his glory? And then Jesus took them through the book of Moses and the writings of the prophets and explained all the scriptures. It's interesting, I still like this, what Jesus said, he called them foolish. I think he didn't mean evil or mean-spirited. I think he just was referring to weak men who were easily confused. I certainly can get confused myself, so I know there are people that have called me a fool before, and it's probably true. But the Lord knows our hardness of hearts. He understands our fragile nature. I believe we all have cracks in our armor that constantly need his tender repair. But... Jesus took this as a wonderful teaching moment. Matthew Henry helped me a little bit in this. He writes, Jesus expounded the scriptures of the Old Testament to them, which spoke of the Messiah, and showed them how they were fulfilled through Jesus of Nazareth. Beginning with the first five books of Moses, the first inspired writer, he went in order, and then through all the prophets. I'm really wondering how much depth he went into. But scripture says he explained them things concerning himself, showing them how the sufferings he had experienced, they were accomplished in scripture. Matthew Henry concludes, he goes, Jesus Christ is the best expositor of scripture. 
even after his resurrection, it was in this way that he led people into the knowledge of the mystery concerning himself. And I think sometimes things are mysteries. God's plan is a mystery. It's ours just to accept by faith and move forward. Now, if we look at continuing scripture in 28 to 31, by this time, they were nearing Emmaus, the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if he were going on, but they begged him to stay. I wonder how they would implore the Lord to stay. But they wanted him to spend the night, so we went home with them. It was nearly evening. The day was almost done. As they sat down to eat, Jesus took the bread he blessed it, broke it, gave it to them, and their eyes were suddenly opened, and they recognized him. And at that very moment, he disappeared from their sight. What a miracle. Can you imagine this experience and the communion in Emmaus with Jesus? Now, they had become enchanted with him. I can only imagine the conversation they must have had. And I think sometimes we're the same way Jesus may want to come near us but we resist him we're either too busy maybe we don't have time to pray properly or read his word but like those two disciples Jesus will open our eyes with truth and then he's gone so I think the key is we must maintain our steady walk with Jesus or we'll miss his revelation we must stay ready now let's finish our text. This is my favorite part. From verses 32 to 35, they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. Upon arriving, they found the 11 disciples and friends gathered together. And they said, the Lord has really risen He's appeared to Peter. Then the two from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road and how they had recognized him as he broke the bread. What a meeting that must have been. Now, After the disciples had spent time with Jesus, they did realize their hearts had burned within them. But as Jesus blessed and broke and gave the bread, this incident must have been the pivotal moment God was waiting for. I think it shows the true significance of an occasion that he allows. When we're in the Lord's presence, sharing his communion, we must celebrate every opportunity when we're invited to his table. It's the gift of his ultimate sacrifice. As the early Christians had a passion and talking of his resurrection, they began spreading the good news like a wildfire gone ablaze. Should we not devote our lives in sharing this precious truth of our Savior with all people we meet? I think there's no greater ministry. Oswald Chambers wrote beautifully of these verses, and I think this is a key point that I need to remember in my heart. Chambers wrote, we need to learn this secret of the burning heart. Suddenly, Jesus appears. The fires are kindled. We have wonderful visions. Then we have to learn to keep the secret of the burning heart that will go through anything. It is the dull, commonplace day with commonplace duties and people that kills the burning heart unless we've learned the secret of abiding in Jesus. In reflecting on our scripture today, I found at least two lessons that I think we can apply to our spiritual life. You may have different ones for your faith journey, but both these applications go hand in hand. The first one obviously concerns faith. The disciples who went with Jesus to Emmaus, as they recognized him, they became joyous they would also receive a true peace, the peace that may only be given by our Lord. I think it would probably be their new mission to spread the good news of Christ to everyone they encountered. Likewise, in our walk of faith, 
we can only build a meaningful relationship with Christ if we spend intimate time with him. If we don't seek him and he's not in our hearts, we will have an incomplete life. We must ask him prayerfully to take control of our lives. As we develop a mutual sharing of love, we become closer to Christ. He leads us into greater ministry service. And I think that sharing of love fuels our spiritual growth. Through his power of his spirit, and I think we all know what that power of the spirit can do, we are able to share what we've learned. But most importantly, we can also show people what he's done for us. It's like we put our faith into action. I think that's the beauty. And is it not our duty to help the lost, the lonely, those who are in pain through our experience with this health crisis, there is no better time than to tell about Christ and to tell others of what he has done for us. William Barclay even said, which really hit me, he said, the Christian message is never fully ours until we have shared it with someone else. Is that not good? Now the second lesson, it's rooted in faith, but it deals with friendship with Christ and what a friend we have in Jesus. In knowing Christ, we learn of a fellowship that blessedly comes in being with other Christians. As the disciples were together in Jerusalem, I believe they found a spiritual bond for those who believed in the risen Christ. Unable to keep the good news among themselves, their intensity of Jesus' love grew more passionately. And I think this is the key for us in becoming brothers and sisters in Christ, a most special fellowship develops. I know it here at this church. Some of my favorite people in the world are here at this church. They are true brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't you believe that we are part of a greater Christian fellowship through our Savior where we share a common love and devotion to our Lord? For most people, I'm in this group, we live doing small acts of service. We experience no miraculous events as in our scripture today. But if you're trying to live a spirit-filled life, walking close to the Lord, and you receive his blessing of true friends, what a gift that is. And the fellowship gained is amazing. Where would we be in this world without having brothers and sisters in Christ, where we share trials and triumphs, sorrow and success, only in our Lord Jesus. Now one short story, a true story, and I'm done. The Gospel Herald publication writes a true story, and I think you will enjoy this one. Years ago, there was a revival meeting held in a church. Many had been saved during these meetings. One night, at the end of a sermon, the preacher asked, is the person who most influenced you in becoming a Christian here tonight? Maybe it's your parent, or a pastor, a Sunday school teacher, a friend or neighbor. I wish you would go arise and go to that person, shake hands with the one who most influenced you to accept Christ as your savior. Well, some went to Sunday school teachers. Some went to pastors. Still others went to friends or church members. To the left of the pastor, pastor on the side pew, there sat an older, aged woman. She had a quiet demeanor. She didn't speak much in public. She was not a Sunday school teacher or an officer in the church. She was only a faithful, gentle Christian woman, mother, and wife. There was a long line of people going to where she sat. Some took her by the hand. Some put their arms around her. When the preacher saw what was happening, he asked for someone to tell the crowd what was going on. One nice-looking man in his 30s came up to the pulpit, looked over at his godly friend, and in a low voice, he said to her, It was your kind, faithful life 
and your caring for others that touched my heart. Many people nodded in affirmation. He continued, your dedicated work for the church and humble testimony for Christ when we were in your home led us to Jesus. It was the beautiful, holy life with which this Christian woman had led throughout the many years of her life that had won so many people to the Savior. May we pray. Our Father, thank you for the message that you give us through Jesus. We are so grateful for the gifts which enable us to live aright today and every day. Please grant to us the faith which can accept the things it cannot understand, which will never turn to doubt. Grant us hope which still hopes on even in the dark and uncertainties which will never turn to despair. Grant us the loyalty which will be true to you even though people deny you, which will never stoop to compromise. Dear Lord, please grant us the purity which can resist all temptation, which can never be turned from the straight and narrow way. And Lord, arm our wills with thy strength, fill our hearts with thy love, so that we may be strong to obey you and loving to serve our fellow men and women and be like our master. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. May we please sing Jesus Christ is Risen Today, page 358.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you. May the Lord bring His countenance upon you. May the Lord bring His joy to your hearts. May the Lord bring His peace unto you. In Jesus' name, Amen.